So we are live in three, two, one. We are live. So good evening and welcome to Bombay Spine Society Fellow Teaching Program. And for further proceeding, I'll hand it over to Dr. Nikhil Joshi. Over to you, Nikhil. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Nikhil Joshi. Uh, today's topic for uh, Bombay Spine Society's Fellow Teaching Program is Tandem Stenosis. It's a small but very important topic from the perspective of learning for all the fellows and residents in uh, spine surgery, as well as for any clinician and spine surgeon. It is very, very important to know that I'm going to deal only with one pathology and there is something not above or below in the spine, which can really cause problem with the outcome of the proposed surgery. So uh, it is a very important aspect and we have to look for uh, the clinical signs and symptoms and each and every patient coming to the clinic with either claudication or with gait disturbance. And we have to find out whether he has got any, he or she has got any significant pathology in the cervical spine, especially when we are looking at lumbar spine as a main reason for the pathology. Uh, let's discuss with few of the important papers in this aspect. Uh, over to you, Sharvari for the next paper presentation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sharveri, and uh, I'll be presenting on tandem stenosis. Uh, so the first article uh, for today is titled uh, Evaluation and Treatment of Tandem, Spin tandem Spinal Stenosis. Uh, tandem spinal stenosis uh, refers to simultaneous narrowing of non-contiguous regions of the spinal canal, typically uh, the cervical and lumbar region. Symptomatic uh, tandem spinal stenosis may be present in more than 10% of patients presenting with spinal symptoms secondary to stenosis present in any one region. So there are a number of challenges, the most important ones being that signs of upper motor neuron lesion as well as uh, lower motor neuron lesions may confuse diagnosis. There may be a delay in detection of stenosis elsewhere, which may result in a poor outcome. So the aim of this review was to um, uh, aim of this article was to review the prevalence, evaluation, and treatment strategy in tandem spinal stenosis. So uh, the prevalence uh, in this uh, article was between four point three to eleven percent. Um, in the first article, they included nine hundred and thirty one patients. It was an MRI study. Uh, they found that cervical cord compression was present in twenty four point seven percent patients. Lumbar spine uh, stenosis in 30% patients, in tandem, uh, sorry, tandem spine stenosis in 11% patients. So they also found that tan tandem spinal stenosis was more prevalent in those who had developmental canal stenosis, uh, male gender, and uh, the incidence increases with age. So another study, uh, they retro uh, Kong et al., they retrospectively reviewed patients who underwent surgery for cervical spondylotic myelopathy. And they found that 39 out of the 317 patients had lumbar canal stenosis as well. So the presentation of tandem spinal stenosis includes symptoms that are attributable to the level of stenosis. There may be a mixture of myelopathy, radiculopathy, or neurogenic claudication, depending on whether the compression is at the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine level. So the symptoms uh, are different when the compression occurs at the cord level and the cord equina level. So for the cord level, there may be a predominantly loss of balance, loss of fine motor control, and bowel bladder dysfunction. There are also upper, neuro, upper motor neuron signs like hyperreflexia. There may be a sustained clonus, a positive Babinski sign, um, Hoffman sign may be positive. However, at the cord equina level, uh, there may be predominantly claudication, lumbar radiculopathy, and rarely bowel bladder dysfunction. Uh, in these cases, there, is, there are low motor neuron signs. Uh, there may be diminished or absent reflexes. So there are a potential a number of potential clinical scenarios that are encountered by us, uh, which would prompt us to look for additional levels of stenosis as well. So for example, if there is a history and examination that suggests cervical myelopathy, but there are absence of uh, there is absence of UMN signs in the lower extremities, 
so we should look for uh, concomitant lumbar canal stenosis as well similarly if there is uh, there is neurogenic claudication or radicular symptoms but there is also loss of balance and bowel bladder dysfunction with a compromise of fine motor tasks then we should suspect a uh, uh, compression at a more proximal level which is either the cervical or thoracic level also in the study they have mentioned that the symptom duration of lumbar spine stenosis is a potential predictor for uh, presence of cervical and thoracic stenosis and this in turn has been linked with the outcome of surgery with long standing cases being associated with a less improvement after surgery so coming to the imaging modalities uh, in the initial imaging modality should include an x-ray uh, which uh, help in assessing the alignment and help in surgical planning mri is the most important modality uh, for diagnosis of uh, tandem stenosis Uh, CT scan should be done in cases of suspected uh, OPLL or ossified ligamentum flavum. Uh, we should also start employing uh, screening MRI images of the whole spine, uh, which may show um, stenosis at multiple levels in such cases. So, uh, coming to the treatment, there is limited role of conservative treatment in tandem spinal stenosis. Uh, may be considered for patients who are uh, who have significant number of comorbidities who are not. candidates for surgery um and surgery should be considered in patients with uh, progressive neurological deficits or those, those who have failed conservative treatment the question however arises whether uh, which level should be operate first and whether all stenotic levels should be decompressed in one sitting or a staged manner so uh, the authors uh, have devised a, uh, a protocol um they suggest that predominant uh, uh so like uh, in case the presentation is of a dominant uh, myelopathy presentation and uh, there is no radiographic instability then uh, cervical level should be decompressed first because um the compression at the cord level is uh, ongoing compression at the cord level is a far more greater risk than uh, compression at a lower level uh, however if there is uh, there is uh, no however if there is no cord comp- uh, no significant cord compression or signal change on mri sequence in the cervical spine and predominant radiculopathy and claudication symptoms then uh, one may address the lumbar canal stenosis first so some authors have also uh, suggested stage su- uh, su- uh, simultaneous surgeries simultaneous surgeries however should be considered for younger patients um, a younger patients who are uh, able to sustain longer surgeries and uh, or, or if the surgery uh, if the stenosis is uh, at contiguous segments in conclusion um, patients with uh, tandem sp- uh, spinal stenosis should undergo stage decompression preference should be given to address the most proximal stenosis first unless it is clear that lumbar spine st- uh, disease predominates and the cord is not compromised this reduces the risk of catastrophic complications and allows observation to determine whether symptoms from distal stenosis improves as well you have one more paper i think is it yes 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 so i think should we discuss should we discuss this and then go for the next paper yeah that's fine no problem so let's let's uh... Yes, uh, so I think it's a very good overview overall, uh, and um, it has it gives a brief what we should do when it comes to lum- uh, tandem canal stenosis. Uh, uh, but there are few things which uh, maybe the paper has not highlighted, and they have suggested that you choose which is whichever is the more symptomatic. But again, one should consider even if you if the lumbar is more symptomatic. and uh, you are planning to do lumbar first you should give due diligence to the cervical involvement considering even a small cervical involvement could be a catastrophic thing if the due diligence is not given for example you should tell the anesthetic the patient does have a cervical component make them aware of it most of the time the anesthetic won't be aware and if they do a some sort of hyperextension while intubating and all then that itself could lead to a serious uh, cervical cord injury so this is something i thought uh, uh, should have been highlighted and uh, as far as possible in our practice 
if we have to we think that cervical takes a precedence until unless it is really really asymptomatic so even a mildly symptomatic cervical uh, sort of take a precedence over lumbar because we know that cervical uh, involvement does have its own set of cascading events so something i i thought i should add to it any anything you want to add Nick? yeah a uh, good point ayush also it that doesn't mention about the peripheral diseases like uh, peripheral neuropathy or uh, compressive my uh, uh, pathologies like carpal tunnel syndrome they are not taken into consideration so especially gait disturbance in an elderly with a diabetes which is uncontrolled or long standing diabetes they might have a peripheral neuropathy which is the probable reason for gait disturbance so thorough clinical examination thorough clinical history and assessment of umn signs especially in if lumbar and cervical stenosis both are present you will not get any hyperreflexia in the leg so you have to uh, differentiate it by examining the upper limb neurology thoroughly that is also important and this is not been mentioned in this paper but otherwise it gives a very good and clear cut algorithm when you can consider and when you should consider stage surgery and when you should consider uh, doing an mri for the upper spine now our training usually in mumbai and everywhere for now is that uh, we are going to take the mri of the concerned area with the screening of the rest of the spine but many of the other centers where sometimes only the detailed mri of the particular area like lumbar spine or cervical spine for that matter is done and they don't do the screening of the entire spine unless on clinical examination you find some important signs which will uh, ask you to or which will uh, we, we will have to take the mri of the uh, detail mr of the other area as well yeah i i think that sums it up i think that uh, due importance to screening mri is very very important and uh, you know and as a routine anyone now a day if you are doing a lumbar just try the screening mri you will be surprised what you find sometime sometimes uh, you know we we in a busy opd you will miss subtle sign of cervical involvement and is the mri which and you see something happening and then you go back and examine and you find that okay and patient also is sometime very very you know the history is not very clear so as a as a rule thumb rule anyone should always get a screening mri with a uh, with a whenever you are doing either dorsal or lumbar so screening mr i think should be the thumb rule for anything you are writing so i think uh, um, point well taken anybody else want to add anything or we should move on to the next paper i think ayush you and me are the only <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no problem. So let's go for the next one, and then we'll discuss. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. This is a label Parkinson's disease. It is a systematic review of literature which is published in the Union Journal. So, Parkinson's disease is referred to spinal canal narrowing of at least two different regions of the cervix uh, of the spine. Most commonly, your audio is not clear. Can you hear me, sir? Still very faint. Just see. Are you using earphones or something? No, sir. Yeah, now it's better. Earlier it was very clear. No, I think it. It's might... clear now. It's clear now. You can go ahead. Yes, sir. Um. Uh... so this entity can be asymptomatic can be an asymptomatic radiological finding or it can present with severe myelopathy or lower extremity symptoms so tandem spinal stenosis uh, may impact surgeon decision making uh, when planning either lumbar or cervical spine surgery and there is currently no consensus in literature regarding the treatment algorithm for the same uh, so the purpose was to investigate the current literature on epidemiology etiology and treatment of tandem spinal stenosis as well as to present the author's treatment strategies so they carried out a pubmed uh, search uh, for articles from january 1980 to 2015 uh, using these keywords 
um, after reviewing about 234 articles, uh, they selected 17 articles which met their inclusion criteria. So they included uh, studies which included adult patients with tandem spinal stenosis involving the cervical and lumbar region with a minimum of five patients and they excluded any uh, animal studies. So uh, in this review, they've included two cadaveric studies, five clinical studies with patients with radio, uh, of patients with radiographic tandem spinal stenosis and 10 clinical studies of patients with symptomatic tandem sp uh, spinal stenosis. So the two cadaveric studies that included here, uh, one of these, uh, they concluded that the presence of congenital stenosis in the cervical spine is associated with congenital stenosis in the lumbar spine and vice versa. So the other study uh, by Lee et al, they found a prevalence of tandem spinal stenosis of 5.4%. And additionally, uh, the presence of uh, stenosis in the lumbar spine carried a positive predictive value of 15.3% for cervical stenosis. And uh, the same goes for uh, the other scenario where lumbar spine um, had uh, cervical stenosis. So, uh, osseous spinal canal stenosis in one region of the spine increases the likelihood of coexisting canal stenosis in the other region. And the overall prevalence of tandem spinal stenosis in this review was 2 to 5.4%. 5, 5. So, uh, another study that they've included here is uh, the study by Kawaguchi et al. And they included uh, hyperostotic lesions involving the lumbar and cervical spine. Uh, out of uh, 20 of their patients, 60% uh, of the patients had tandem spinal stenosis due to either an ossified ligamentum flavum or ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Therefore, they recommended whole spine screening and decompression of all symptomatic levels. Lee et al. Uh, analyzed images of cervical, uh, spine, uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy patients uh, with uh, cervical spine images of symptomatic lumbar spine stenosis patients, and they found 25% incidence of cervical spine stenosis as well. They identified certain risk factors, uh, which included age more than 70 years, uh, multi-level lumbar uh, stenosis, and uh, male gender. Uh, this is one study that, include, uh, that uh, was based on treatment uh, they found that uh, patients, uh, they, uh, out of 158 patients, 12 patients had uh, tandem spinal stenosis, out of which seven were due to OPLL. And uh, they suggested stage cervical decompression to be performed first in the presence of upper motor neuron symptoms, evidence of myelopathy, and primary upper extremity symptoms. Out of these, eight underwent uh, cervical decompression. Out of these eight, uh, eight further requ four required lumbar decompression as well. They concluded that uh, surgeons should maintain a high index of suspicion in, um, for tandem sp spinal stenosis in patients who are diagnosed with OPLL. And they suggested a stage, uh, a stage decompression and they found that cervical uh, region should be addressed first as majority of their patients, that is 67% uh, patients, did not require a second surgery. Some authors have advocated simultaneous decompression for cervical and lumbar spine uh, um, in patients with tandem spinal stenosis. So they utilize two separate operative uh, teams for cervical and lumbar decompression. And uh, this resulted in a shorter operative, operative time and lesser blood loss, although there was no difference in clinical outcomes. So they suggested that simultaneous decompression avoids rare but devastating complications uh, related to positioning in cases of severe stenosis. But uh, it does not. Uh, but it does require an additional uh, operative team, and uh, the patient does undergo a second surgery. So certain precautions that need to be taken are uh, careful positioning, uh, as Sir said, um, uh, while uh, positioning and uh, intubation, one must avoid hyperflexion or hyperextension of the neck. Adequate padding of all bony prominences. Uh, one must consider neuromonitoring and severe stenosis. In case of OPLL, uh, screening of lumbar as well as the cervical spine should be done. If imaging uh, does not support uh, the diagnosis, uh, then uh, one must image the thoracic spine as well. Thank you, sir. So in conclusion, uh, tandem spinal stenosis is a common condition present in up to 60% of the patients. Identification uh, of tandem spinal stenosis is of paramount uh, in, uh, in management of such cases. Although there is no spe uh, intervention, both stage and simultaneous pro uh, procedures are effective. However, um, 
uh, surgeons must address the more proximal stenosis as a priority. Yeah, so this sums up with the what we have discussed in the first paper also that you need to address, as Ayush also said, that address the uh, most proximal stenosis first. If there is a team, if your test is happy and uh, the patient's general condition is, is favorable and uh, they can sustain the anesthesia for that much time, I think simultaneous surgery is okay. But if the patient is very frail, as one of the studies have mentioned earlier, age more than 60, and uh, if the expected blood loss is more than say 400 ml, 300, 400 ml, and the duration of anesthesia is going to be very high. In that case, I think the stra uh, staged approach is a ideal one. And uh, I think this has been highlighted again in this paper as well. Yeah, so nice overview. Uh, again, uh, one more, th one very interesting thing, and I again supported is what they said. Most of the times, if you're seeing a tendon canal osteosis and you do the cervical and wait for some time, the symptoms do get away. Yeah. So you have to, so that one of the paper mentioned. So again, while deciding, it it, it remains controversial. And this, uh, the different papers in the review gives the overall picture. So you really need to see what you need, what, what really has to be done. So now it comes down to basically you have uh, always cervical takes the priority. If, if you feel that the lumbar is a small component, you can just do the cervical and wait for the wait for some time before you do the lumbar. And in up to 50 to 60 percent of the time, you'll be surprised that the lumbar component has de decreased and they don't need a lumbar spine surgery at all. And if you want to do a bo tackle both, again, the option is to do in one go, but you have to consider the overall safety of the surgery and overall uh, the fitness of the patient to undergo a, a long surgery. So this is where it lies. So, so you really need to uh, judge the tendon canal stenosis and give priority to cervical spine when, 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 whenever you see one. That is where I think. We'll move on to the next paper. Vidre, are you ready? Yes, sir. Yeah. Shall we please unshare your screen? Uh, still there was confusion regarding how we should operate should we do a stage surgery versus uh, should we operate uh, one level first so the, this is a paper from china uh, by cow at all which uh, studied should we operate simultaneously or stage for a tandem stenosis uh, it was published in journal of orthopedic uh, surgery and research in a recent 2021 edition it is a retrospective study uh, so, uh, we all know as defined the tendon stenosis is compression of uh, more than one level in the spinal canal, most commonly the lumbar and the cervical. It was first given by Daki et al. The aim of the study was to uh, find the outcomes of simultaneous uh, decompression versus stage operation and uh, to see which uh, region to operate or decompress first. So, they included all symptomatic tendon stenosis patients which were operated for number spinal decompression between January 11 and 18. Uh, they initially admitted only patients who had either cervical or lumbar disease and then screened those patients and then found that do, did they have any uh, simultaneous decompression. This is one of the contentious part of the paper. The inclusion criteria were that they included only some symptomatic patients, mainly cervical or lumbar, or which have both upper motor and uh, lower motor neuron lesion, but uh, without any clonus or hyperreflexia. They uh, defined cervical canal stenosis as per Lee et al. and Kang et al. Uh, and lumbar canal stenosis. And also they did EMG NCVs for complex symptoms. They excluded any patients with tumors, infections, fracture, any other, any other deformities or medical <coughs> uh, myelopathies. They formed an algorithm for which they operated. So to summarize, all patients that were operated for cervical decompression, which had uh, predominant cervical symptoms, were uh, grouped into group C. Those patients that predominant lumbar symptoms were first operated for lumbar decompression and were uh, wait, waited to see if they need any cervical surgery. They were grouped as group L. 
and there were other groups just pl where both the stages were operated together up in staged patients first after one of the surgeries was performed they were uh, watched over to see if the other uh, symptomatic Uh, region did they develop symptoms or it improved uh, and in severely debilitating symptoms if the symptoms did not improve then the second stage surgery was performed so uh, there were 89 patients who formed fell into group c which is that is that cervical was operated first 29 into group l where lumbar was operated first and 14 where they were operated in the same sitting of the 89 patients uh, the c1 group included all those patients who needed only cervical and c2 group included those patient which needed a concomitant lumbar surgery now the main difference was that the lumbar goa score was significantly higher in c2 score which means that they were significant more lumbar symptoms and that is why they needed the second surgery when the lumbar group is compared uh, here the l1 and l2 groups were l2 groups of the patient with needed only lumbar surgery versus l1 with did only lumbar surgery l2 needed a second stage cervical surgery here also l2 groups had significant cervical goa scoring that is why the, they had significant cervical symptoms along with lumbar symptoms but since lumbar was predominant lumbar was operated first here a very uh, important thing to notice is that the number uh here we see that in cervical the number of patient that needed a second surgery that improved with a single surgery were 34 uh, as of the 89 which was more than 40% here we see that only 3 patient uh, needed a single lumbar and 26 of them needed a second concomitant cervical surgery so uh here they discuss that uh, as we know that still there is always a confusion and always a debate regarding that should we operate the patients in a single sitting or we should we operate in a stage level and uh, now it was suggested by liu vettel that all cervical patients had a should be operated first because there are chances that they will improve there are some proponents of the lumbar surgery first saying that when you do the lumbar surgery the posture of the neck will improve go into flexion and thereby increase more space and so they may not need a cervical surgery uh, so here the single stage surgery people say that here if we operate a patient Uh, in the single stage there is some time for the other symptoms to regain and the patient may not need a second surgery when we are doing a stage surgery the cervical should be operated first they postulate the reasons being that the natural history of cervical spine is a step ladder pattern of a progression so there are very high chances of the cervical progressing as compared to the lumbar also the lumbar illness is relatively slow uh, and so non surgical management generally works in lumbar as compared to cervical and cervical uh, and decompressing the cervical cord may result in improvement of lumbar symptoms and spas because the spasticity improves and so the claudication may also improve so uh, the single stage surgery is generally preferred in patients which are young and fit the advantage being that there's a lower cost of surgery because it's a single sitting surgery and the total hospital stay is also lower so they concluded that the Uh, if you are doing a stage surgery, the first cervical stenosis surgery significantly decreases the chances of the second lumbar surgery, and uh, one stage decompression is also safe and effective in patients which are young and fit. So, to critically review the paper, uh, one of the uh, critical point for this is that the number of patients uh, selected in the surgery are too less to standardize the thing that all only cervical should be operated first or uh, uh, to. define that single stage surgery should be performed also this is a retrospective study so there is a selection bias in any of the patient they have not significant or specified that what is the amount of compression that is there in the other level so that uh, we can say that uh, is the patient selection uniform or not thank you is there any mention about uh, any patient with thoracic myelopathy or no thoracic sir no sir only it's only cervical and lumbar patients that they included and so, initially they included only patient which had single either a cervical symptom or a lumbar symptom screened them if they so that is one of the drawback that the patient selection was a little uh, thing that the first they defined in one of the places in the paper that they only found patients which had a single level compression screened them for an mri and then included them and in one of the parts they mentioned that they have included all patients with tendon stenosis but uh, overall this paper is in con- uh, with, is in coordination with what we discussed that if the, there is cervical and lumbar then operating cervical may resolve the lumbar symptoms if lumbar symptoms are not predominant and if cervical is the predominant symptom okay any comments ayush 
No, no, I think this just uh, tells us what we have been talking. No, nothing yes. new in this. Yes. We have almost covered everything which they spoke in this paper. Right. Okay. Next paper, Rudhar. No, sir, there, there's just one paper. Uh, okay. Now there we discuss cases. So, should we go ahead with the cases? Anybody wants to ask any question or any query about the papers? Okay, we should go ahead with the cases then. Who is presenting first? Whether you want to present? Yes, I'll uh, go ahead with the first case. Yeah. So, uh, in 84, one year old a patient, male patient presented to us uh, in uh, March this year. Uh, he had complaints of low back pain since three or four years, neck pain since last one to two years, bilateral upper limb radicular pain, and uh, had symptoms of claudicating for 100 to 200 meters and imbalance while walking. There was no bowel bladder disturbance. She, he had diabetes uh, mellitus. And he had a typical myelo uh, neurology was intact. However, bilateral upper limb, bilateral knee and ankle were hyperreflexes. Stunter was extensor, and pulses were palpable. So, uh, this patient, as we discussed, uh, classically has all the three criteria that uh, define tandem stenosis, which is claudication, imbalance, and hyperreflexia. Uh, so, clinical diagnosis from this I will be straightforward. Sir, any from the clinical scenario, any other clinical diagnosis that uh, comes to your mind? Only other thing is he does he does not have hyperreflex and upper, the upper limb. limb. Yes, that's the only difference. Okay. That is the only thing which, the which, which is contentious. Somewhere yes. in the thoracic spine, rather but than. Sir, but he also has bad upper limb radicular pain. So yes. cervical red. So cervical radicular pain is one of the things that will define that there is something in the cervical, but. Uh, there is nothing, no hyperreflex in the upper limb, so it may define that there is low cervical pathology rather than a higher cervical pathology that we are looking into. Yes. So the uh, on symptomatic is a classical presentation of tendon stenosis with all the three criteria. So sir, uh, next we did X-rays. Uh, it showed degenerative cervical and lumbar changes, uh, which are there. Uh, since he was an 81 year old, but however, there was no significant distresses in cervical lumbar region where we will plan for fixation. And the MRI was done. So, so these are the MR cervical and uh, lumbar spine MRI. So, sir, uh, after this MRI, what do you think should we plan? Have actual images as well? Uh, yes, sir. No, just a second. Sorry. I think uh, the screen stopped sharing. Uh, can you, sir, uh, see the screen? I can see, but this is something that is not your case. Okay. 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 Yeah, so these are the actual images. <coughs> So there is a myelomalacia as well. Yeah, the, the typical two dot sign that we see, which is a sign of a bad myelomalacia here. The sign. Okay. No, no, just read the MRI, then we can sir, discuss uh, it. Sir, sir, this is not the... you. You can ask one of your colleagues to read it. I okay. will be better. Yes, sir. Involve others for the discussion. Let them read the MRI, and then sir, we can uh, discuss what to do. Sir, uh, we can st uh, start with Charvari to. Uh, yeah. Read the MRIs in this patient for the first the sagittal ones and then the yeah, Sharvari, can you read the MRI? Yes, sir. So, on sagittal images, there appears to be uh, compression, uh, th there is cord compression at uh, C5, C6 along with the signal uh, change. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the lumbar spine, sir, there is stenosis, there is compression at L4-5 
and L three four as well, sir. Okay. Uh, have you done oh, any dynamic X-rays? Sorry, sir. Any dynamic X-rays done? Uh, sir, dynamic X-rays were done, but sir, it was not significant, so I have not kept it in the. All right. Okay. So there is there was no linear. No instability. There was no instability in the survival well of the lumbar spine. Survival yes. spine. Fine. Okay. Are you sure want to add anything? Sir, you are not audible. Uh, still not audible. Can you hear me? Hello. No? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now. Okay. Yeah. So, so just I was asking, like, when you are looking at this MRI, now this is a this is a T two image. Okay. Uh, do you uh, do you as do you want to see something else? Uh, is considering say myelopathy. Do you order any other image? Any other any other things sir, as well? We like to see T one images also. Yeah. Why, why do you want to do that, sir? Uh, to see that. Uh, because that will help us in knowing how the recovery of the patient or prognosis of the patient so if uh, there yeah, is exactly. a high t2 t with a low t1 then there are low chances that the patient will improve because it is uh, gliosis that has already happened and the chance of recovery decreases yeah yeah so so exactly so that's that's what i wanted to point out so when you have something like this this looks like a you you are seeing looking at a significant signal changes okay yes. in the cervical spine so, so definitely, at least for this case, I will also look at the T1 images, okay? No. And do you know any classification for these signal changes in cervical spine for myelopathy? Sir, uh, there is classification which defined the, based on the fuzziness on actual uh, MRI. So, on so they classify as grade one, two, three, and four. Where uh, yeah. the first there's an ISI that... classification. ISI. You can yeah, you can read about it. So they basically you can grade these changes as well depending on T1, T2 images, and this this so there is some controversy about whether they really tell you anything. But as as a fellow and you should know all these, okay. Just for your academic point, I wanted to point it out. So you should go and look at those class. You should know. You should be aware about it. And for sure, if you see such a significant changes in T2, you should have a look at T1 image as well. Because this, uh, what we are looking here, appears to be quite significant. Mm -hmm. That that so we can go ahead with it. Yes, that so, that sir, was my problem. yeah. So your plan would be only lumbar or cervical and lumbar, or and so, what if cervical then the approach. So so now again, uh, see uh, age. What did you tell the age of the patient? Yeah, uh, is a eighteen-one year old male patient. Okay. Uh, and go go to the image once uh, images, more. Uh, uh, these are the sagittal yeah. images. Yeah. So 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 for see uh, definitely cervical definitely appears to be significant significant. Okay. And uh, L four five in lumbar is is there, but uh, but again as we have discussed, uh, considering the age and everything, I think uh, for me the cervical will take precedence. Okay. And uh, there is a significant posterior compression coming in the cervical so and um, so i will most likely do the cervical first uh, go for the posterior um, again fixation or no fixation uh, i prefer fixation but even if you don't fix it it's completely up to you i am fine both ways and maybe a, if the symptom persist a second stage uh, lumbar will be my thing nikhil what do you what will you do Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can yeah. You hear so, me so. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, your, yeah, opinion. Yeah, your opinion, please. Yeah. So, yeah, considering your age of the patient, I would agree with the posterior surgery because the anterior surgery at 18 uh, are not uh, having any uh, good result per se in the in terms of outcome. Secondly, uh, if the patient is medically fit, and as Rudra has already mentioned that uh, patient has got significant claudication also and, and uh, uh, he has got no dynamic instability on x-rays uh, in lumbar spine as well as thoracic spine i have a, a possi possibility of having a team work and do the cervical and lumbar in both both uh, in single setting if the patient is fit and anesthetist is happy about the overall patient situation and both will be just decompression 
and so no anterior only uh, from the point of view of age or also an mri which because here significant compression oh, mri is also so, so ayush has already mentioned that that the compression is uh, also significantly from the posterior side and in one go if i can address both the pathologies for the age 81 that would be really great for the patient so that because we don't know whether he will be able to withstand this surgery Thank come you. back for another anesthesia avoid any complications and get back to his own life okay so sir we did a c3 to c7 laminectomy with a 4 5 3 to 5 uh, decompression so this was done in single setting single setting yes sir single with two teams Okay. Okay. Sir, did you uh, do a single stage or yes, sir, single single stage thing sing, single stage uh, decompression? A uh, single stage cervical plus some. So 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 it totally depends. I think if you have a two team, it's worth doing yes. single stage. Yes, thank you. If you are doing alone, then again, so it totally depends on the setup you are working. Yes. So this is the second case. A uh, fifty-three-year-old male patient uh, came with mid-back pain, claudicating. Five minutes only bilateral leg pain and groin pain and imbalance while walking. There were no bowel or bladder issues. He was hypertensive and diabetic. Uh, on examination, he had a myelopathic gait. Neuro was intact. Uh, there was bilateral ankle and knee hyperreflexia. Plantar was appearing. Upper limb was normal. A uh, sensory level was D10. Uh, he was claudicating and uh, imbalance and hyper. So again, this falls into the definition of uh, tandem stenosis. So. on past history uh, he had uh, symptoms similar symptoms of claudication 1999 for which he was operated for a lumbar laminectomy and fixation oh. with steffi plates uh, it doesn't end here in uh, 2020 he developed upper limb symptoms right now he does not have any upper limb symptoms but he developed upper limb symptoms for which he was operated for a 5 6 fixation so what is the clinical diagnosis that we are looking at now just without uh, any images can you so go back to last the uh, examination slide please sorry sir can you can you go back to the history and examination yes sir so sir on history the that is the history and examination mm -hmm. so again you have to look at the thoracic spine now fine yes sir, because he has a sensory band uh, that is there that is yes, you look at, at the, the same time he has got see. two levels already operated and taken care of the only area which remains to be seen is thoracic spine unless he has developed the adjacent segment disease at mm -hmm. the level above the area of, in lumbar spine which is operated so so, so there is no upper limb symptoms so the first thing that we look is the dorsal myelopathy that we discussed the other thing is that the patient's radicular symptoms improved but uh, maybe at that time he might have some subtle myelopathy which was not noticed so the other differential will be a suboptimal cervical surgery which we can look uh, into because the patient has a tendency of multi level segmentation so we perform this investigation that the cervical spine mri post op and that is the dorsal lumbar spine mri so can somebody else from the audience uh, read the mri please we have uh, uday kumar and yeah dr uday dr uday please read the mri uh, good evening sir uh, there is a uh, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament in pll in the cervical region sir and uh, stenosis at uh, the thoracic region at t12 and uh, t11 and t12 and t10 and t11 sir yes sir yes anything, anything at the adjacent levels uh, above the area of fusion in the lumbar spine yes sir adjacent segment degeneration Oh, is this? Yes. Uh, L1, L2, and L2, L3. Right. Do you think that it is OPLL or it is just a disc osteophyte complex in the cervical spine? Because it is, it is not clear. You will require actual image and even the another surgical image as well. Yes, sir. But uh, when do you think that it is a OPLL and not the disc osteophyte complex on this T uh, two weighted image?
जनरली सो इफ दिस इफ दिस कंप्रेशन ऑन द एंड ऑब्लिटरेशन ऑफ द सी एस एफ फ्लो ऑन द एंटी एस्पेक्ट ऑफ एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द कॉर्ड इज सीन इवन बिहाइंड द बॉडी ऑफ द सर्वाइकल वर्टिब्रे देन यू शूड और थिक ब्लैक लाइन बिहाइंड द सर्वाइकल वर्टिब्रल बॉडी देन यू शूड सस्पेक्ट ओ पी एल एल और एनी एनीथिंग लाइक हाइपरोस्टिक कंडीशन विच कैन मेमिक दिस टाइप ऑफ माइलोपैथिक सिम्टम्स so not necessarily this patient has got opll here because you can see that it is only at the level of the disc isn't okay. it yes yes are you do you have ct for this because from in my book ct is a must when i see this i yes, won't sir. touch this patient without a ct scan of course yes. yes sir do you have the ct yes sir we do have the ct scan so okay. first so we that's what uh, i discussed that we cannot plan Plan based on just the MRI images. We yeah. would miss something if we don't do a CT scan. So sir, that is a CT scan. Can we have a closer look of the cervical axial C C three four something? I can see in CT. Yeah, there. Do you have a closer view of that? Uh, no, sir. it looks like pretty significant uh, we yeah, know that the thoracic is thoracic is there we know from the mri but the ct so, uh, as you as we were talking it does throw in a surprise sometimes so sir what will you plan in this so so uh, sir if see if this for me okay now uh, if the ct looking at this ct I think sir, I I will uh, definitely consider cervical as well. No doubt about sir, that. Sir, uh, cervical and dorsal. And and of course the dors uh, the the dorsal segment. There that is there. That is no doubt about it. But that that we knew it before even before we saw the CT scan. Okay. Yes. But now the, with the CT, that's why we needed the CT and that 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 should be the highlight of it. Now with the CT, that cervical also becomes very very significant. You got. because you know even when you are inducing it with this amount of impingement and if you see in the mri there is no csf flow in posterior and that mri is taken in a in a prone uh, in a in a supine Supine. position it is not a standing imagine then patient standing and with uh, with uh, some amount of uh, extension and now you imagine the compression which is happening so overall it becomes a significant compression in cervical as well at least for me although i will go through each and each, each and every section of the ct and and uh, and mri even the axials to to give a to uh, have a better idea of it but whatever you have given me for me both the cervical and the thoracic are the culprit and i will tackle both of them so sir here when we did the mri one other significant thing that we noticed was the significant yeah. compression at the junctional level so yeah, yeah. what we were thinking about in the mri Uh, mm-hmm. so was the level which was somewhere here and That's yeah so exactly level. so so you have to you have so to consider this is another also. thing that we need to do not just the level where there was an opll in the upper disc was also the junctional level which we can yeah yeah i agree level. so it has to it is all the three all now the but when you when you having all the three you really need to go through each and every section of mri and ct and mm. you really need to plan it out so yes. you have to give so, you have to prioritize it Yes. for me always cervical takes the priority then okay. come the thoracic and then comes the lumbar for the obvious reason mm-hmm. but which one you will tackle first will go once you go through the detail of each and every section okay mm-hmm. but at least i will look at all the three okay. before i uh, set out to plan it so again ct scan as we were trying to idea is to pick out something of this case so ct scan Uh, is uh, again very very important and sometimes you will in we will be in for a surprise like this so sir in this you will do a uh, cervical first then uh, most the... most likely because i think cervical is a and a, a, how fit the patient to undergo yes. multiple yes. so sir uh, here uh, we oper- we operated the junctional level first because patient had a sensory Level which was D10, he was already operated for a cervical spine recently in October. The patient patient presented to us in March, so six months back he was operated for a cervical ACDF. 
Mm-hmm. So we did not want to operate the cervical spine at that time. We operated the junctional level with the dorsal spine along D10 to L2 decompression using mm-hmm. azonic scalpel uh, under you know neuro monitoring. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we planned for a stage surgery in case the patient did not improve. Then maybe do a cervical at the second stage. Currently the patient has improved and still luckily does not have not needed a cervical surgery for now and is improved. So you are absolutely fine with what you are doing, okay? But again, even yeah. when you are doing that uh, dorsal or whatever, you have to be extra careful. I, you should be aware that there yes, is, there is something. Yes, there that is. is the most important. Yes. So what happens if you are not aware of it, even you not as as I as we were discussing earlier, then and you what will happen? You have operated for dorsal and you suddenly see that upper limbs are gone. So that is what you want to avoid, and that is the whole idea of taking this class of tendon canal stenosis. to enforce upon you to be aware of it okay if you feel the dorsal is the most important you can go ahead with the dorsal but again you should be very very aware of what is happening in cervical and uh, if uh, if you have to tackle or take cerv- cervical for uh, for me uh, again I, i we don't have the all the cuts but uh, i will definitely consider this cervical whether we do it or not that is a different thing. okay Uh, so how long is my connection up? connection is sir uh, right now he is 6 months follow we operated him in march and there are still no upper limbs no he improved he has improved in the lower limb the claudication has he improved, improved because the most compressive segment was, was the junctional was so on post yes. we realized the most compressive segment was actually the junctional level which was also the quad level d12 uh, level along with the dorsal spine even interop the maximum compression and indentation was there at the junction level so did you got a post op ct mri after post op mri not yet not yet so, so because so the, yes. so the, these cases again we get a post op okay. mri okay. and it it at least if nothing it tells us what is happening okay yes, and you can if nothing you can tell the patient see we have done this Something. and this remains to be done so even they understand whether they need it or not no one can predict okay that is how most of, some of as the paper was telling that after one stage yes, 30% true. or 40% so that is how it is so maybe your patient might not ever need it mm-hmm. but it is better if you can document it and counsel him for if needed a second stage cervical yes that that is yeah. that is what i would say otherwise i think that is absolutely fine i wish from the fellows learning point of view how uh, how much duration after your surgery you will ask for the post op mri the number one question and secondly uh, uh, for for this type of patients what will be your uh, protocol suppose you are operating both the levels cervical and lumbar now just i am taking this ahead from the perspective of what happens post operatively whether you keep them in bed for a long time whether you start as if you are starting with as you usually do for a single level or single means cervical or lumbar surgery what do you, what do you do for the patients so so we have a fixed protocol for all myelopathy whether tandem or not tandem for all my cases they get a post op 